Chapter 18 Almer arose at dawn and stepped outside to stretch and clear his head. He had been awoken in the middle of the night when the two girls and the priest arrived, and he hadn't fallen back asleep quickly. Now he was tired. There was more than that, though. The Edmund had arrived yesterday, and Almer hadn't figured out what that meant for him and his farms. He walked from his house to the stables and went inside. The boy who looked after the horses, Atta, was asleep on a pile of hay. Almer could have told him to get up and saddle his horse, but he didn't want to disturb the boy. He could saddle his own horse. Besides, he didn't want to talk to anyone right now. His favorite horse for riding, Hjofenfjör, was a beautiful bay gelding, and he seemed happy to see Almer approaching. Hjofenfjör meant heaven fire, that is to say, lightning, and the horse had a distinctive jagged white mark on its nose that suggested the name. Almer saddled him quickly and led him outside. Atta stirred at the sound of the stable gate, but Almer waved him back to the pile of straw, mounted Heofenfjör, and rode off. Almer owned twelve hides of land. Each hide was a plot big enough for a family to run, and the families paid him rent. This meant that he didn't need to farm his own land. More than that, he was the lord over the nearby villages and farms, and any free man was sworn to fight for him, should he need it. He was wealthy enough to be called a thane, a nobleman. At twenty-two years old, he was young for a thane. He would not have been one if his father had been alive, but his father had died two years ago, leaving Almer to run the estate himself. He had done well, he thought to himself. The families that farmed his land had kept up the supply of wheat, meat, cheese, and wool, the basics that anyone needed to survive. He was able to trade with the peasant farmers nearby for fish, honey, ale, and whatever else he needed. He had married last year, and his wife had a child on the way. Things were going well, but now Yadmon's visit threatened to shake everything up. Almer made a large circuit of some of his fields. He passed the house where the two girls and the priest were staying. That was an odd business. One of his farmers had come to him the afternoon before with a young girl, twelve years old maybe, who said she had come ashore miles down the coast with a sick priest and needed help. He had told the farmer to take two horses and a wagon and bring them back quickly. A priest was to be afforded every possible privilege. Priests were uncommon in towns and villages. In fact, Almer hadn't seen a priest since he was married last year, and for that they had to send a request to the monastery fifty miles away. He hadn't met the strangers yet. He knew the priest was sick and needed care, and he had told one of the farmer's wives to look after him with all the skill she could manage. A priest could be valuable. Maybe this priest would stay. Maybe Almer could have a church built. A church could mean a town, and a town could mean a market. Give it five years, maybe ten. More trade, higher rents, more land. He could make something of himself. Hjolfenfuhr cantered on as Almer imagined his future, eventually completing a circuit and returning to his house. Almer's house was not huge, but it was well made. It looked much the same as any house or hall in England, Frisia, or Denmark rectangular, with a hearth in the center and a thatched roof. It was only when his own house was seen next to those of his tenant farmers that the difference was clear. His had plastered walls and a door made of oak. His had space for guests without feeling cramped. His had fresh straw on the floor instead of dirt. Most of all, he didn't share his house with animals, as most of his farmers did. He arrived back at his house as people were beating to wake. His wife, Elfled, was being helped by her handmaid. The girl was the daughter of one of his farmers. He didn't have a servant himself, though. Maybe some day, he thought, but really, what man needs someone waiting on him all the time? Almer was about to greet his own wife when Yadman rose from his own bed and greeted him. God grant you good morning, Almer, Yadman said, smiling, and Almer forced a smile in return. Today I was hoping you could show me your farms. I would love to see them. My uncle always spoke highly of how your father managed his tenants. Almer retained a smile, though inside he noted with annoyance how Edmund credited his father instead of him. Edmund was only eighteen. Thin and wiry, he wore his blonde hair down to the shoulder, and he had only the faintest wisp of hair on his chin and upper lip. He seemed always to be smiling, but maybe that was just when he was around Almer. When Edmund had arrived the day before, unannounced, he had acted as though he and Almer were old friends, when in reality they had only met once before, three years earlier. 
Since he had arrived, Yedmond had managed to mention his uncle in conversation at least three times, and he might as well have been saying, My uncle, the former king. Almer had a feeling that that was connected to the purpose of the visit, but Yedmond hadn't mentioned it outright yet. Very well, said Almer. I'll wash first, if you don't mind. They spent the morning riding from house to house, farm to farm, talking rents, wheat fields, and bales of wool. Edmund was complimentary and very curious about how things worked, as if he was gathering information for later. Almer asked whether his estate was similar to Edmund's, and Edmund disclosed with mild embarrassment that he had no lands of his own, but had been living with his mother as a guest of her brother, who had lands nearer with them. When they got to the house where the new visitors slept, Almer insisted on leaving them alone for now. Edmund was particularly interested in the priest. A nobleman needs someone who can read and write, as well as for saying mass, of course. I look forward to meeting this priest when he's ready, said Yadmund. Something about the way he said it made Almer wonder if Yadmund wanted to keep the priest for himself. On the way back, Yadmund came around to the topic he had been avoiding so far. He and Almer kept writing slowly, but Yadmund made sure he could see Almer's face and judge his reaction. I thank you for your hospitality and your instruction, said Yadmund. As you know, I was only sixteen when my uncle, King Yadwald, fell in battle to Coenwulf of Mercia. Your father was his loyal thane and was slain as well. It was a dark day for our kingdom. I was there, said Almer. The war between Mercia and East Anglia had been going on and off for years. Mercia had ruled East Anglia for almost fifty years until Mercia's king, Offa, finally died. It was East Anglia's chance to rise up, and they did, led by King Yadwald, but two years ago, the new Mercian king, Coenwulf, crushed their army, as he had done to the kingdom of Kent in the south. Many East Anglian nobles had been killed, and Coenwulf's forces now ruled uncontested. Some say that a warrior should stand by the side of his fallen king, no matter the cost, said Yadmund. All have heard the story of Coenwulf and Cunaherd, and how their men refused to yield even in defeat. Those were brave men, to be sure, but, my friend, I am glad you lived to fight another day. Almer couldn't tell if this was a slight or not. His king and his father had been slain on the field, but he himself lived. Some would call it shameful. Of course, Yadmund hadn't even been there. But now, Yadmund continued, I think the men of East Anglia are ready. Coenwulf is distracted with Northumbria. If we had five hundred men, we could take our kingdom back. It would be a difficult fight, said Almer, considering. But the men of East Anglia are brave. Very true, said Yadmund. When we have driven Coenwulf's men from our lands, I can take my rightful place as king, and our forebearers will be avenged. Almer remained silent. Are you with me? asked Yadmund eagerly. Will you fight for your king? Almer had seen this coming, and had been agonizing over it. Yadmund was the rightful king, and Almer had a duty to fight and die for him. Only a coward or a traitor would refuse. Still, the harvest had been good. There had been peace for two years, and Coenwulf took no more in taxes than any king would. Almer had a child on the way. Why risk it all just to change kings? And why this king? Yadmund had never fought in a war, much less led an army. Would enough warriors join him? What was the point in joining a lost cause? Nevertheless, Almer knew his answer already. There had never really been another possibility. Yadmund was his rightful lord, and as a thane, Almer had a duty. The shame that would fall on any East Anglian lord who would not fight was a worse fate by far than death. I am with you, my king, said Almer, not meeting his eyes. Yadmin whooped with joy and clapped Almer on the shoulder. It's settled then. We'll march on Mercia in the spring. But first I need my lands back. Your uncle's lands near Ipswich? asked Almer. Yes, and Ipswich itself, said Yadmin. Coenwulf seized them after the battle, and I'm left with nothing. They are mine by rights, but without land I have no money and no men. How else can I give rings to my warriors? How many fighting men can you muster? Almer considered the villagers and peasant families up and down the coast from whom he could demand service. Ten, maybe, he said, but most have only spears and shields. They're farmers. This fight will ennoble them, said Yadmund enthusiastically. When we take my lands back, they can keep anything they take off the Mercians. Could any of your tenants fight? We could grant them lands. Almer liked this plan less and less. Granting lands to his tenants meant they wouldn't be his tenants anymore. 
Tin isn't enough to fight anyone, Almer pointed out. Oh, there are thanes throughout East Anglia who will rally to their king. Ten thanes with ten men each? A hundred men could take back Ipiswich. Twice that can bring down Mercia. Give me the oaths of twenty lords such as you, and we can take our kingdom back. They had arrived back at the house. Edmund, in great spirits, handed his reins to the stable boy and went to get ready for the midday meal. You must hold a feast tonight for your fighting men, said Yadmund over his shoulder. They can swear their loyalty and we will drink a toast to our victory. Tomorrow, said Almer. He stayed behind to help with the horses and to be on his own with his thoughts. He brooded over the idea that if a war went badly, he could lose everything. Of course, he could also stand to gain if their army won and Yadmund gave him land and treasure. Still, something else bothered him more. Almer thought back to the horrible scene after the former king had lost to Coenwulf. He had hardly swung his sword that day. He had been in the back of the East Anglian forces, and though a few arrows whistled past him, no enemies had come close until the Mercians had chopped their way through two rows of their opponents, and the East Anglian line had wavered and then crumbled. As the men on his own side had backed up further and further, they began to stumble and step on each other. The Mercian forces rolled over them, swinging and stabbing as momentum carried them forward, and suddenly Almer found himself fallen backward onto the ground with a tangle of spears and shields as others turned and ran. Within minutes the East Anglians had given up. They had not fought to the last man, as warriors did in songs and stories. The East Anglian men had knelt before Coenwulf and pledged their loyalty, and Almer had joined them. Coenwulf had congratulated them on their bravery and allowed them to return to their homes, then he and his army marched on Ipiswich and claimed it for Mercia. Almer had not mentioned that oath to Yadmund, and he wasn't sure whether Yadmund knew about it, but it put him in an awkward position. He had now sworn loyalty to two different kings, and he was going to have to betray one of them. Yadith awoke on a pallet covered by a blanket, and had to work at remembering exactly how she had gotten there. She looked to her left and right and saw that Gunhild lay next to her sleeping on a pallet of her own. It was late morning, judging by the light, and she was on the dirt floor of a house. The walls were plastered with mud, and the roof was thatched. There was a central hearth surrounded by stools and benches. Chests, barrels, and baskets were lined against the walls, and two bed frames with straw mattresses stood at the far end from the door. On one mattress lay Father Wilfrith under a blanket. On the other sat an old woman spinning wool into yarn. Hello, Yadith said quietly. The woman looked up and smiled. Oh, good, you're awake. How are you feeling? Yadith realized that she was exhausted. Every part of her ached, and her head felt muddled and sore. You'll need some time to rest and recover, I'm sure, said the woman. My name is Tibba. At some point I look forward to hearing how you came to be here, but that can wait. My name is Yadith, said Yadith. That's Father Wilfrith in the bed. He's from an abbey in Kent. And that's my friend Gunhild asleep there. She's Danish. She won't understand much of what you say. Where are we? You're on Lord Almayer's lands. This is East Anglia. You sound like you're from Northumbria. From Heritu, yes, said Yadith. It was attacked by Northmen. Have you heard anything about it? Not I, said Tibba, but we don't hear much from anywhere beyond the village. Lord Almer will stop by some time, and he might know more. Are you hungry? Tibba put down her spinning, and Yadith got shakily to her feet and came to sit by the hearth. Taking in her surroundings, she noticed a smell like stale urine, but didn't want to say anything. She gladly accepted some hot porridge and ate it hungrily. As she ate, she began to tell Tibba her story. Maybe an hour later, Gunhild awoke also. Where are we? she asked Yadith in Danish. England, a few days south of my home, said Yadith. Come, eat. This is Tibba. Gunhild stood and looked around. She smiled and nodded at Tibba and came to sit by the fire. What's that smell? she asked. I think we're near a tannery, said Yadith. Or a fullery. You could always smell it in my village when they were fulling cloth. What is that? said Gunhild, taking a bowl of porridge gratefully from Tibba. You know, soaking cloth in urine to make it softer. 
Gunhild wrinkled her nose. That's disgusting. Why would you do that? It makes the cloth much nicer. Really? Gunhild looked skeptical. Actually, I never told you this before, said Yadith, but the wool you used with your family always seemed a bit coarse and oily. But in my village we needed to make cassocks and blankets for the monks, and they wanted the best wool. A few times each year the fullers would put the raw cloth in big vats of pea and stomp up and down on it. Gunhild made a face at the idea. Who's pea? The villagers, said Yadith simply. Just then a girl of about fifteen came through the door. I'm back, Grandma, she said, then seeing the two girls at the hearth, greeted them excitedly. I'm Onlef, she said. I'm so glad you're awake. How did you get here? Yadith found herself telling her story from the beginning again, and realized that it wouldn't be the last time either. Anlef was dressed simply in an undyed woolen dress and leather shoes. Her auburn hair was pulled back from her freckled cheeks and braided. Her smile put Yadith immediately at ease, though Gunhild, unsure of what she was saying, watched her cautiously. I live here with my grandparents, said Anlef. My grandpa Ched is out talking to a neighbor. Come on, let me show you everything. She took both girls by the hands and dragged them toward the door. Anlef, said Tibba, let them rest. We're fine, said Yadith, laughing, and she and Gunhild followed. Anlef showed them the pigs in the pen outside, and the garden with winter cabbage and onions. A small stream ran by in the distance, and beyond that fields left bare after the harvest. Then Anlef led them to a big pit covered by wooden planks. That's where Grandpa soaks the hides to turn them to leather, said Anlef. Yadith translated for Gunhild. Is that what smells so bad? Gunhild asked. No, Anlef explained. They're soaking in oak bark. What you smell is in those barrels, she pointed. Before they get scraped, the hides get soaked in urine. Grandpa collects it from around Lord Almar's tenants. It's his least favorite job, he says. Where are your parents? Yadith asked. My mother died in childbirth, along with the baby. Then my father died of the bloody flux about five years ago. That's awful, said Yadith. I'm so sorry. Anlef nodded. The flux went through Lord Almer's tenants and the nearby farmers all at the same time. A dozen people died, at least. It's a terrible way to go. Who's Lord Almer? He owns the land. We pay rent. My grandfather was born in this house back when Lord Almer's grandfather was alive. We've always been here. I would love to go and see the world like you have. Yadith didn't point out that she was seeing the world against her will, and that most of what she had seen was Gunhild's farm and a lot of ocean. Sometime afternoon, Wilfrith woke up too. His fever had broken, and although he was weak and couldn't talk above a whisper, his cough was gone, and Tibba pronounced him out of danger. Anlef was excited to have other girls near her age in the house. She had been very interested in Gunhild's lyre and had tried playing it. Then she brushed and braided Yadith's hair, and then Gunhild's, and chatted about the other tenants on Almer's farms. Two neighbors had gotten married recently, but hadn't been able to have a ceremony yet. It was a situation many peasants found themselves in, for there weren't any priests nearby. Technically the marriage wasn't valid, and they were living in sin, but some things couldn't wait for a priest, said Anlef. Apparently news of Father Wilfrith's arrival had spread quickly, and Anlef was sure that the couple would soon come looking to get his blessing. It wasn't surprising, then, when Anlef's grandfather, Ched, returned home with a friend who said he had terrible joint pain. When he had found out that a priest now lived in Ched's house, he had come right away to ask for a cure. A priest doesn't have time to bother with your knees, Bayo, Tibba scolded her neighbor. He's sick and he needs rest. Well, maybe he could just whisper a prayer, said Bayo. It would be a great relief. Tibba sighed and led Bayo over to Wilfrith and explained the request. Wilfrith smiled good-naturedly and touched Bayo's knee and said something in Latin. And the other one, said Bayo, putting his foot up on the bed frame to present his other knee. Wilfrith blessed his other knee, too. And my knuckles, father, said Bayo. Both hands. They ache terribly in the morning. Shame on you, Bayo, Tibba griped. All our knuckles hurt in the morning. Let the Holy Father rest. Bayo ignored her and took Wilfrith's hands in his own. One more prayer. Please, father, he said, and the priest spoke again in Latin and sank back onto the mattress. Bayo thanked Tibba and Ched and departed, but it wasn't long before a new visitor arrived. Hilda wasn't one of Almer's tenants. She had a small cottage near the village. She was the closest thing to a doctor, midwife, or pharmacist for many miles. 
She greeted everyone in the house as she entered, and Tibba, happy to consult her on Wilfrith's health, greeted her as she beckoned the older woman to the back of the house. "'Father, do you remember Hilda?' asked Tibba. "'She met you when you arrived late last night. She gave you the tea.' Wilfrith smiled weakly and apologized for not remembering. Hilda asked him a few more questions and felt his head, then gave Tibba some more willow bark to make more tea in case his fever came back. However, she didn't leave immediately. She pulled out a leather bag of charms and emptied them into her hand. These charms are for healing, father. Could you bless them? Yadith could see Wilfrith look suddenly skeptical. She strained to hear his response. That doesn't sound... he began... That's not very Christian. Oh, no, father, said Hilda. I assure you it's very Christian. Look, I carry the cross of our Savior. And she pulled from among the small stones and animal teeth a bronze cross. Wilfrith didn't respond, so Hilda continued. These horse teeth are very good for headaches. You hold one while you say the Lord's Prayer three times, then sleep on it. Wilfrith didn't look too happy about it, but he held his hands above the bag and the charms and spoke again in Latin. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Hilda, not understanding what he had said, and pleased with what she thought was a blessing, went on her way. As she was leaving, Yadith heard hoofbeats approaching. Ched went outside to look, followed by Anleth, Yadith, and Gunhild. A young man in a green tunic, brown leggings, and leather boots dismounted his horse. A cloak was fastened around his shoulders with a gold brooch. Yadith saw Ched bow to him. "'Welcome, Lord Almer,' the old man said. Almer looked at him. "'How is the priest doing?' he asked. "'He is well, my lord,' said Ched. "'Tibba says he will get better quickly.' "'Good,' said Almer. "'There will be a feast tomorrow evening for our guest, Yadmund. "'Bring the priest to join us.' "'Yes, my lord.' "'Are these the two girls?' Almer asked. "'They are, my lord.' "'How did they end up with the priest?' Before Ched could answer, Yadith bowed and said, My lord, Father Wilfrith rescued us when we were stranded in Frisia. We are bound for Heritu, but our boat is in need of repairs. Yadith had never spoken to a thane before, and hoped she had done it correctly. Almer looked at her and scowled. I see, he said. Then turning back to Ched, he said, Tomorrow night, don't forget. He mounted his horse and rode off. Almer's house was bigger than any peasant's, but it was not the feasting hall of a king. Nevertheless, with tables and benches and food and ale, and eight of his sworn men from nearby farms, it was starting to feel like one. None of the other men were thanes, but they owned land, and many had servants, tenants, or slaves, making them a cut above the other locals, men who had time and money to fight as well as farm. No one had been fighting recently. Cohen Wolf's forces hadn't disturbed them. There had been peace since the death of Yadwald. Nevertheless, their first duty was to their thane, and their thane was now sitting by a young man and calling him king. Yedmund was in high spirits and talking of battles long ago, battles made famous in songs and stories, while holding some roast chicken in one hand and a cup of ale in the other. Almer, said Yadmund, that reminds me of that one song, the one that goes axe and spear. You know which one? Almer nodded. It was a common one among many fighting men, especially when the ale was flowing but he didn't feel like singing. He didn't feel like feasting. He knew Yadmund was in a difficult position. A king won followers from feasts and gifts, but this was exactly the kind of thing that would get Cohen Wolf's attention and ruin Yadmund's plans before they had even begun. Nevertheless, Yadmund had already started to sing, so Almer joined in. When Beowulf with Brekka swam, axe and spear, axe and spear. When Beowulf with Brekka swam, God guide my arm. When Beowulf with Brekka swam, the prince of Geat's glory won. Axe and spear, axe and spear, flesh, blood, and bone. Many of the men had joined in, and some began to pound the table to keep time. When Atla fled from Morleon, axe and spear, axe and spear, 
When Atla fled from Orleon, God guide my arm. When Atla fled from Orleon, Theodoric was trampled down. Axe and spear, axe and spear, flesh, blood, and bone. It was this ruckus that greeted Yadith and Gunhild as Anlef ushered them into the hall. Anlef brought them to sit on stools away from the feast, and then went to let Alamere know they had arrived. Gunhild had taken her lyre with her. When Yadith had asked about it, she shrugged off the question because she couldn't quite explain why. They were being presented before an important lord. The last lord she had met had imprisoned her and threatened to execute her, and she couldn't be certain she wouldn't have to escape again at a moment's notice. More than that, the lyre was the only thing she owned besides the clothes on her back. It was a comfort to her. It made her think of Gregory and Gislinda. It had seen her through a storm and near starvation. She didn't want to leave it back at Tibba's house. The song finished, and Yadmund was beaming. He stood and looked out at the table of other men, and a hush fell as they waited for him to speak. Good friends, noble countrymen, welcome to my feast, Yadmund said. Almer smiled blandly and wondered how this had become Yadmund's feast and not his own. Two years ago, my uncle the king fell in battle, and Coenwulf took everything from us. But soon we shall regain our honor. Let all know that East Anglia shall always be ruled by its own king and no one else's. May God lead us to victory. There was a general noise of approval from the gathered men. Tonight, said Yadmund, I will honor my dear friend and loyal Thane Almer. Almer looked up in surprise. Soon we will begin traveling our kingdom to meet with other Thanes and claim their allegiance. Although we have not yet stood by each other in battle, I owe him much already, and know that when the sun glints off of enemy helmets, he will not turn away. Almer was impressed. Yadmund was sounding more like a king now. However, this was the first time he had said anything about traveling together. Almer, said Yadmund, rise and accept a ring from your king. Yadmund took a thick gold ring from a pouch and held it up. Though it wasn't much compared to what a powerful king might give, Almer knew it might be one of the few things of value that Yadmund owned. Almer stood, and Yadmund, looking truly grateful, pressed the ring into his hand. The men pounded on the table in approval. Almer looked at the young man, barely past boyhood, who stood a good four inches shorter than he did. He didn't look like a king yet, but he might one day. Onlef approached quietly from behind. My lord, the girls who came with the priest are here, as you asked, she said. I asked for the priest himself, said Almer. I'm very sorry, my lord, said Onlef, but my grandmother says he is not well enough to get out of bed. It will be some days still. Almer frowned. So why are the girls here? Bring them before us, said Yadmund. I wish to know about them. A king's feast might have peasant girls serving food, but none would ever be presented before the guests. Nevertheless, Yadmund was curious about their story, and Almer wasn't going to argue. As Anlef waved Gunhild and Yadith forward, Yadith felt her stomach rise. She grabbed the cloth of her dress to stop her hands from trembling. In all her life, she had never seen a king or set foot in a feast hall. She had no idea what to do. She walked to the middle of the room near the hearth and made an awkward bow. Gunhild did the same. When Yadith stood upright, she could see the king was laughing, and she waited in confused silence. Are these my new court musicians? laughed Yadmund. How kind of you, Almer. What do you mean? asked Almer. The taller one. She has a lyre. It seems you found me a harpist. Mm, of course, said Almer, getting the joke and chuckling. A mighty king would have poets and musicians to entertain him and to compose poetry in his honor. Of course, girls would never perform before a king. Yadmin seemed to find it particularly funny. What a king am I, right? I have no lands and no gold. I have eight men with spears, and my harpist is a little girl. My friend, if I ever grow too proud, remind me of this evening. Come, girls, said Almer. Tell us how you came to be here. Yadith surveyed the room and tried to think quickly. She could tell that the man who called himself a king was in a good mood. He struck her as the kind of man who would be generous if she played things right, but she didn't have much to work with. She looked at Gunhild, standing with her lyre, looking lost, and she made a quick decision. Gunhild, she said quietly in Danish, will you play for us? 
me? said Gunhild. Play the harp? Why? Trust me, said Yadith. Just play something for me to speak over. Gunhild sensed that asking any more questions would lose them time, and that Yadith had a plan, so she took the lyre in her hands and braced it against her hip. She quickly tested the strings to check that they held their tune, then began to play patterns up and down the scale. Yadith listened with her eyes closed for a moment, then stepped forward and raised her head to the men of the feast hall and the king who sat before them, and began to speak. Happy was I, Hera to my home, until came sailing a ship of woe, a pack of wolves wielding steel. I crossed the billows, bound and beaten. I found myself a farmer's slave. They knew not God, but gave tribute to foreign gods, false and frightful. The Danish family's daughter Gunhild, Northman's kindred, kindness showed me. Freedom called us, fleeing swiftly, a sail serpent, a sleek vessel, we steered across the seabird's hall. Yadith looked around to gauge the reaction and saw that all eyes were on her. All conversation had stopped. Yadith could see looks of approval, even amazement. Oft did lightning light the heavens. Once a seal from sea wolves found a refuge with us, a rare welcome. On land a bee thief lumbering found us. I knew not fear. Fighting fiercely, facing down the forest dweller, I sent him fleeing. Sweet was victory. This got some laughs, and Yedman pounded the table with his fist in approval. On far off shores in Frisian lands, a man of God, a good hearted priest, aided us escaping westward, rowing mastless. Mighty sea swells lashed our hull. The Lord of Life, Heaven's steward, sent salvation, granting passage. A gracious king, a noble lord, now lends us aid, this evening standing safe within the famous prince's feasting hall. Other men joined Yadmund in pounding on the table enthusiastically. Yadmund was laughing aloud, and even Almer was smiling. Gunhild caught the signal that Yadda's poem was over, and she brought the music to an end. Amazing, said Yadmund, when the cheers had died down. You have a gift, truly. Your journey must not end here. Of course we will help you. Where is your boat? Seven miles south of here, my lord, said Yadith. It has no mast and no fishing net. Well, you shall have those things, and food and water for your journey. But I have news about Heritu. Yadith's jaw dropped in surprise. What is it? she asked. What did you hear? Well, after the Northmen attacked, the abbey was abandoned, and many villagers moved south to Yoverwich or Strandshall. You should check there first. Yes, my lord, said Yadith. Almer, said Yadmund, make sure they have warm clothes, blankets, food, and water. Everything they need. We'll send men to help them bring the boat up to... Uh, where would you suggest? They should have a mast and a sail in a few days, wouldn't you say? Yes, my king, said Almer, hiding his grimace from Yadmund. The sail alone would cost a handful of silver. Yadmund had just given away Almer's money and resources as if they were his own. A king must be generous, of course. Everyone knew a king's reputation hinged on the gifts he gave, but Almer couldn't help feeling annoyed. Nevertheless, he resolved to try to enjoy the rest of the evening. He ordered some food to be sent back with Gunhild and Yadith, and told them that some men would come help them with their boat in the morning. Then he refilled his cup of ale and gave a toast to King Yadmund. Three days later, the fairing had been brought to the nearby village, repaired and outfitted. Yadith and Gunhild planned to leave the next day, as much as they regretted having to leave Onleth, with whom they had developed a fast friendship. Wilfrith was able to stand and even walk around now, and had regained his voice as well. He hadn't decided when he would begin his journey to the Abbey of St. Augustine, but thought he might wait until spring. Yesterday had been Sunday, and he had celebrated Mass in the open air in front of Almer's Hall. When Yadith and Gunhild were ready to leave, he teared up, and took both their hands in his. "'God bless and keep you both,' he said. "'Safe travels. "'Are you sure you won't stay?' "'I have to find my parents,' said Yadith. "'They don't even know that I'm alive.' She paused. "'Of course, I don't know that they're alive either.' She looked back at Wilfrith. "'That's why I have to go. "'It's only seven days up the coast.' 
The afternoon after Yadith and Gunhild departed, Atta the stable boy brought a horse to Tibba and Ched's house. Lord Almere asks the priest to come visit him. He sends this horse for the Holy Father to use. With Ched's help, Wolfrith mounted the horse, and Atta led the horse slowly back to Almere's hall. When they arrived, Atta brought Wilfrith in and announced his arrival. "'You are well, Lord Almere?' said Wilfrith. "'I am, thank you,' Almere responded. He seemed about to say more, then stopped and looked toward the hearth, where his wife's handmaid was boiling water for washing clothes. "'Lula, girl, I need to speak to the Holy Father alone.' The girl left the hearth and went outside. When the door was closed, Almere resumed his conversation. Father, I was wondering whether, now that you're feeling better, you might like to relocate here, to my own house. I thought you might find it more comfortable. I thank you, said Wilfrith. I will soon go travelling for a while with Edmund, said Almer, so I must ask you something now. Please consider staying here instead of returning to your abbey. I could build a church. We have much need of a priest. You are very generous, said Wilfrith. May I take some time to think about your offer? Certainly. Almer paused and looked around the room again, as if checking for anyone listening. He lowered his voice. There is one other matter. Could you write a letter for me? I have a quill and ink over here, and parchment. Of course, said Wilfrith, happy to be of use. This letter, said Almer, it is of a sensitive nature. I trust you to be discreet? I will, agreed Wilfrith. Very well, said Almer. He paused to collect his thoughts, then began to dictate. To Coenwulf, King of Mercia, Kent, and East Anglia, Almer, son of Althmar, sends greetings. <laughs>